studies, I'm honored and delighted to welcome you all here this evening to the fourth annual James Baldwin Lecture. This series is the brainchild of my friend and colleague, Ed Glaude, the William S. Todd Professor of Religion and the Center for African American Studies. Eddie conceived of the idea of this annual lecture as the occasion for bringing the Princeton community together to celebrate the scholarship of a distinguished Princeton faculty member and to reflect on complex issues concerning the meanings and the constructions of race. Moreover, the Baldwin Lectures provide us with the opportunity to honor the extraordinary legacy of the late James Baldwin one of America's most powerful cultural critics and essayists, Baldwin exemplified ways in which we might remain critically focused upon and engaged with the relationship of race to democracy in American society. The inaugural speaker in the Baldwin Lecture Series was Anthony Appiah, the preeminent philosopher, followed by Leonard Barkin, the distinguished literary scholar in 2007, and Bonnie Bassler, the MacArthur Prize winning molecular biologist, in 2008. We are deeply honored that our Baldwin lecturer for 2009 is Professor Anthony T. Grafton, the Henry Putnam University Professor of History here at Princeton. Professor Grafton joined the History Department in 1975 after earning his A.B. and Ph.D. in History from the University of Chicago. In his scholarship, he explores the past through the eyes of influential and original writers and has written intellectual biographies of a 15th century Italian humanist, architect, and town planner, Girolamo Cardano, and a 16th century French classicist and historian, Joseph Scaliger. He, he also studies the long-term history of scholarly practices, such as forgery and the citation of sources, and he's worked on myriad other topics in cultural and intellectual history. Tony Grafton is the author of an astonishing number of books and the co-author, editor, co-editor, or translator of many others. His most recent books include Worlds Made by Words, Scholarship and Community in the Modern West, where he considers the fact that although scholars lead solitary lives, in order to win independence of mind, they also enjoy the conviviality of sharing a project sustained by common ideals, practices, and institutions. Um, that's one of his recent books. And another recent book is Obelisk, a History, co-authored with Benjamin Weiss. A regular contributor to publications such as The New Yorker, The New York Review of Books, The American Scholar, and The New Republic, Professor Grafton has won an, a stunning array of prestigious awards and prizes, including the Guggenheim Fellowship, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, the Balsam Prize for History of, of Humanities, and the Mellon Foundation's <coughs> Distinguished Achievement Award. Those of us who know Tony know that he is legendary both for his erudition and his generosity of spirit. He has worked assiduously and imaginatively to transform the intellectual life of this campus and to elevate the profile of the humanities in general. Uh, to mention only a few examples, during his tenure as chair of the Humanities Council, he developed an array of high visibility events and programs. He proposed the creation of the Old Dominion, professor the Old Dominion Professorships. And he initiated a recruiting program for extraordinary high school students interested in the humanities. Given all of these outstanding professional achievements and contributions, my colleagues in the Center for African American Studies and I could imagine no one better than Tony Grafton to continue the tradition of the Baldwin Lectures this year. Thank you so much, Tony, for coming to speak with us this evening on the topic race and renaissance. Thank you so much, Val, for that wonderful introduction. And my thanks to the program in African American Studies for the extraordinary honor of this invitation to speak after Anthony Appia, Leonard Barkin, and Bonnie Basler is so great an honor that I am having trouble stopping myself from running out of the room screaming in terror. 
And I feel that way not only because of the extraordinary predecessors uh, in whose afterglow I bask, but also because to speak on race in the Renaissance is a real challenge for someone like me. I spend my time as a scholar with people like that. Um, <laughs> learned men, <laughs> fierce men, men who wielded a bent nib the way the hockey masked character in a horror movie wields a chainsaw. I work with people who read intensively many, many hours a day. And you might not think that race necessarily or obviously or substantively played a role in their intellectual lives. And it was in their books and in their margins and in their writing that they lived their intellectual lives. Well, I don't think that's true, as I'll try to show today. And so I thank you very much for the honor and the challenge of speaking in a series named after a writer whose reflections on race in Europe are not among his least distinguished accomplishments. I would just like to say one more thing before I begin, and that's to pay a tribute to another very great African-American writer who just passed from the scene, John Hope Franklin. I had the very great fortune to be a student at the University of Chicago when he served as chair of the history department, the first African-American to chair major history departments at Brooklyn College and then at the University of Chicago. And he treated me as he treated everyone else with an intellectual and personal warmth and generosity that make his memory a treasure and his scholarship, of course, an eternal challenge. So just one moment to say how much I owed Professor Franklin. And now to the other learned man, the kind I spend more of my time with, with whom I start. In the summer and fall of 1613, the great Protestant scholar Isaac Casaubon was a worried man. This wasn't unusual. As a Calvinist, he went through the world oppressed by an ingrained sense of unworthiness and guilt. An entry at the start of his thousand-page Latin diary gives a good sense. I got up at five, alas, how late. Over and over again, he tortures himself about the friends whose pleasant visits interrupted his work. Amici in amici, my friends are my enemies. About his failure to write all of the books he had planned. And about his own financial incompetence, he was a sucker for handsome young Protestants who came with sob stories. Um, though when Madame Kasaubin, a far more sensible person, was home, she drove them off with a broom and saved him. Every year, he cast a trial balance of his use of time and chastised himself for unbelievable sloth. This, although the record shows that he published some 20 folio Latin books laced with quotations in Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, produced 22 children, 19 of whom survived childbirth, <laughs> won the respect of younger scholars across Europe, indeed worked so hard that he killed himself, according to the distinguished surgeon who autopsied him in 1614. In the Catholic world, they always autopsied saints. In the Protestant world, they always autopsied the learned. Um, he had managed to aggravate a congenital inflammation of the bladder by his inattention to the call of nature while reading. <laughs> Kasaubin's unremitting work won him more than respect. At the end of his life, he occupied an extraordinary, indeed almost unique position as a scholarly advisor to King James I of England, a learned man in his own right, and the one, of course, who had sponsored the biblical translation that goes by his name. For the last four years of his life, 1610 to 14, Kasaubin's job was to have lunch with the king. That meant that the king sat alone at a table and ate, and Kasaubin stood behind him and answered questions about the meaning of particular biblical verses and various fathers of the church. Even Kasaubin found that the time sometimes dragged just a little <laughs> during this process. He was a celebrity for learning in an age that valued learning as we until yesterday valued money. I don't know what we value anymore. Like many Christian scholars of his generation, Kasaubin took as deep and serious an interest in Hebrew and Aramaic and Arabic as he did in Greek and Latin. He studied 
the Bible intensively, making his own copies of the books that meant most to him, in this case, the book of Esther. He particularly loved Psalm 119. He read Jewish biblical commentaries, scholarly treatises, philosophical and legal works, and more unusual things like Jewish prayer books, which he read through. In the top left, you can see him translating Hebrew prayers into Greek as he reads. And on the bottom right, you see him wondering why a male Jew prays thanks God for not having made him a woman, um, something which a Protestant had difficulty with. What he really loved in the prayer book was the slichot, the prayers for forgiveness that Jews say on Yom Kippur, the day of repentance. The guilt-filled Calvinist felt, found real kinship with the guilt-filled Jews. And he also admired, for example, the great ceremoniousness with which Jews carried their Torah around the synagogue during their rituals. All of this effort had a distinctive purpose. Gesalbin's main job, the real job for which James brought him to England, was not just to have lunch with the king, but to attack a fortress of Catholic scholarship. Cardinal Cesare Baronio, Vatican librarian, had written at the end of the 16th century the first great Catholic church history in 12 crushingly learned volumes steeped with erudition. He argued, as, his, as the iconography of the title page already suggests, that only one true Christian church had ever existed, the Catholic one. Bishops, the mass, scholastic theology, all had come into being with the birth of Jesus himself. When he reflected on what Jesus called his apostles, Baronio thought, well, what would he call them? He called them apostles. Um, a strange thought, if you remember that Jesus didn't actually speak Greek. In 1578, when friends of his reopened the catacombs in the Appian Way outside Rome, Baronio exulted. Here, he thought, he found archeological evidence for his great thesis. The Catholic tombs on the Appian Way, he believed, were modeled on the tomb of Jesus, as that was described in the Synoptic Gospels and marked the beginning of a new Christian form of burial with no precedent. Casaubon disagreed. He disagreed at 800 folio pages length, perhaps the worst book review ever written in an age of polemical scholarship. Casaubon insisted that the early church had actually been deeply Jewish a church created by Jews, some of whom spoke Aramaic and read their Bible in Hebrew, some of whom spoke and read their Bible in Greek, a church which preserved beliefs and prayers and rituals from Judaism for early, during its early centuries. Jesus did not, Kasabin said, call his helpers apostles. He called them shelechim, as Kasabin found out by talking to a Jew and asking for the proper term. And he assembled a vast amount of information in this ferocious piece of ecclesiastical polemic. In search of ammunition to fire off at his Catholic opponent, in May 1613, Casaubon visited what's still one of the world's greatest scholarly libraries, the Bodleian in Oxford, founded by Thomas Bodley just about 15 years before, with its splendid reading room still in use and many innovations. The Bodleian had a donor's register which celebrated not just Bodley himself, but everyone who gave the library books or money. And to that extent, it's the ancestor of this great university with its <laughs> wonderful ability to celebrate everyone who helps it, and of all modern universities. It also had an acquisitions budget, rare for libraries, but unfortunately soon exhausted. And most remarkable of all, it didn't allow books to circulate. Normal libraries in this period opened for a couple of hours a day or even a couple of hours a week and lent even precious manuscripts to their users. The Bodleian made you take an oath not to bring fire into the library. You still have to take the oath to work there. Uh, but it also made the scholars come to the books. So Kasabin loved it. In the course of spending seven or eight hours every day in the Bodleian, he not only made vast pro pro progress with his work, he also made the acquaintance of every serious scholar in Oxford. And there were many of them. One of these new friends proved especially fascinating. In theory, as you all know, England had had no Jewish inhabitants since the 13th century when Jews were either expelled or executed en masse. In practice, as James Shapiro and David Katz have taught us in wonderful books, 
Jews lived in early modern England in small numbers, some explicit, some avowedly Jewish, more of them as converts. Bodley hired one, we don't know his name, to catalog the Hebrew books when he opened his library. In Kasaubin's time, another Jew named Jacob Barnett from Italy lived in Oxford. He taught Hebrew to young men who were becoming ministers and helped the local scholars with their work. A charming man with a gift for languages, he had won respect and affection from his pupils and employers. A contemporary describes him as a young man of comely presence, a smiling countenance, and graceful behavior. Kasaubin's diary shows that they spent day after day together in the Bodleian, where Jacob showed him Jewish texts. Most exciting, Jacob helped Kasaubin read the Talmud, the great and infinitely complex code of Jewish law. In Bava Batra, the uh, tractate which is open on the left, Jacob showed him a passage on Jewish burial law, and on, which proved that the kind of tomb described in the Synoptic Gospels was not a Christian innovation by Joseph of Arimathea, but a normal Jewish tomb. Fantastically excited, Kasaubin took down the passage and a translation which Jacob must have dictated to him, his fingers trembling, as you can see from the notes which we've been able to identify. When Kasaubin's Oxford stay drew to a close, he took Jacob back with him to London. For a few more weeks, they worked together, sharing meals. I wish I knew what they ate, but we aren't told that, and studying together. Then Barnett headed back to Oxford with seven enthusiastic letters of recommendation from Kasaubin. By the early fall, though, this happy friendship had begun to inspire anxiety. Friends in Oxford informed Kasaubin that Jacob seemed interested in converting to Christianity. Suddenly, the good and the great began to take an interest, always a bad idea. The Archbishop of Canterbury thought it would be wonderful to have this learned Jew convert. So did the king. By September, the vice chancellor had decided that Jacob would be converted in the University Church of St. Mary's on the High Street in Oxford at the formal university service on the first Sunday of the fall term. The Oxford Hebrew professor, Edward Kilby, reported all this to Kasaubin, wrote to him for advice. All, hardly any Jews had been converted in England in recent times. There was one famous case in London in the 1580s. But basically, no English cleric knew how to convert a Jew. <laughs> you, it was illegal to baptize adults, and they were going to have to do it. So he wrote to the great expert on liturgy and said, what do we do? And Kasaubin replied, don't. I actually think he's Jewish. This is a bad idea. This is Kasaubin's worry, and he was right. The Saturday before Jacob's baptism was to take place, the clerics went to find him and discovered that he had put a knapsack on his back and started running down the London road. Men were sent after him on horse and foot, the proctor's beetles, presumably. They caught him. They brought him back to Oxford. They put him in Bocardo, the university prison, and there, the professors of theology and Hebrew began an extended good cop, bad cop routine, depriving him of sleep and food and demanding that he convert. Peter Goldman, not Jewish, a Scot who lived in Oxford and had studied Hebrew with Barnett, was horrified by the treatment of Jacob and wrote to Kasaubin begging him to help. He, feared the, he said that Jacob feared uh, horrible reprisals, maybe death or, star or starvation. The scandal was enormous. The small world of the university trembled, as our small worlds always do, caught in the spotlight of attention from those higher than we in the hierarchies of the world. This story comes from a research project on Kasaubin and the Jews that I've been carrying out in collaboration with a great expert on rabbinics at Oxford, Joanna Weinberg. I'll tell you how it all comes out at the end of the lecture, because it's in the conclusion of the story a kind of micro-history, I hope, of the sort that my wonderful colleagues, Natalie Davis and Robert Darton and my great friend Carlo Ginsberg have carried out, that one sometimes sees the great trends in intellectual and cultural history most clearly. And that's what I'm going to try to do. But before we can get there, I want to try something a little bit different. To ask, as the great French historian Lucien Febvre did a century ago in a book, or half a century ago, sorry, in a book on Rabelais, whether he was an atheist, if it was possible that race could have played a substantial part in these proceedings. 
Obviously, race in its modern senses couldn't. The intellectuals of the 16th and 17th centuries did not dispose of the taxonomies of peoples drawn up by 18th century philosophers like Blumenbach, the full theological justifications of slavery drawn up, for example, and reworked in the 18th and 19th century American South, or the biological justifications of slavery of the later 19th and 20th centuries which also depended at their core on ideas about race. Yet, it might be possible, indeed I think it is, to argue that ideas about distinct peoples, ideas that eventually would become part of the modern notion of race, already play a constitutive role in this story. Traditionally, historians believed that racism was really alien to the Renaissance in the early modern period, and especially in this kind of scholarly milieu. And there was reason to believe that. The letters that Kasaubin's friends from Oxford sent to him when Jacob Barnett was with him in London contain greetings to their friend, Jacob. And this term was well chosen. It reflected a sense that learning transcended barriers of religion, barriers of nationality, barriers of difference. Learned men in the 17th, 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries often described themselves as citizens of an imagined community, the Republic of Letters, which they described as stretching across the world, all the way to China on one side, to New Spain on the other. In everyday life, hierarchy ruled, sumptuary laws required everyone indeed to dress in a way that befitted his or her rank and function. But in the Republic of Letters, as one observer wrote, the whole world is embraced. It's composed of all nationalities, all social classes, all ages, and both sexes, and reputation hangs only on one's merits. This imagined community embraced principles rather like those that Anthony Appiah espoused so beautifully in cosmopolitanism. Above all, the belief that people who differed could usefully converse and could find reason for respecting one another's differences. Accordingly, Jews as well as Christians occasionally gained membership in the Republic, as in the famous cases of Spinoza and Manasseh ben Israel, and so did a certain number of black Africans. This is the portrait of Jacobus Capitain, bought into slavery on the Guinea coast, brought to Holland, where he studied Latin and Greek in The Hague and theology in Leiden, and eventually wrote a learned thesis arguing that Christianity did not, in fact, condemn the slave trade. Um, a thesis brilliantly edited and translated by a Princeton student, Grant Parker, who's now a brilliant professor of classics at Stanford, and an extraordinarily erudite piece of work, even if one finds it hard not to regret the argument that Capitain made. If you try to think, as Lucien Febvre did, of the mental toolbox that scholars brought to bear as they thought about people and individuals, it seems, at first hand, hard to think that race would have been, um, even in an inchoate form, a prevalent way for them to do so. One basic tool for understanding the relations among peoples, perhaps the basic one of the 16th and 17th centuries, was genealogy. The art that assembled families, nations, and aristocracies, and indeed the, the entire human race on the branches of a fictive tree. Genealogies mattered. They established which ruler could claim a given territory, which men and women could claim noble status, which men and women could marry one another. And genealogies did differ, especially since the very scholars who drew up the real genealogies also sold fictional ones for large profits. Um, you know, there were no consulting gigs in the 15th and 16th centuries, but there were great aristocrats who wanted you to prove that their ancestry was really, really ancient. This is part of the fictitious genealogy of Alexander VI, or the Borgia Pope which showed, if I could show you the whole thing, that he was descended from Osiris, the Egyptian god. <laughs> it, it wasn't true. <laughs> now, <laughs> one of the ways that 15th and 16th century intellectuals tried to grasp the history of the human race was genealogical. And one of the most powerful universal histories, visually as well as verbally, comprehensive in its presentation of conventional wisdom, gives us a sense of how this worked. 
This is from the very beginning of Hartmann Schädel's Nuremberg Chronicle, a magnificent illustrated world history published in 1493. And as you can see, a work of collaboration in which the scholar not only wrote the text, but drew up storyboards, which the artists and printers who carried the work out followed in a very precise way. So it's a work in which the illustrations go with the text and can be taken as a key to its interpretation. The Chronicle was a historical guide to life, the universe, and everything. It started with the creation. It told the story of Adam and Eve in paradise and the fall. And it went through all of later history down to the looming end of time itself. Um, Schadel left three blank pages between his own time and that, so you could fill in the, the difference. It's a kind of 15th century Wikipedia compiled by scholarly content providers, um, not trying to innovate in its presentation of materials, but to give you a kind of set story drawn from the Bible and other approved sources. And this chronicle gives one, by meshing chronology and genealogy with geography, what we all used to think of as a kind of standard history of humanity, one in which the three sons of Noah, Japheth, Shem, and Ham, each become the ancestor of one continent, Europe, Asia, and Africa. There is no curse here. You know, in, we used to associate the curse of Ham with Ham's connection with Africa. I'll come back to that. In this version of genealogy, there is no curse. Here are the children of Ham, the lower part of this genealogy. You can see if you go around the, down the bottom row to the children of Cush that you finally come to a black man, a black patriarch, that is Dedan, the father of the Ethiopians. But you notice that he sits next to Saba, the father of the, uh, the African Arabs, on the same branch of the tree. Now, blackness does not distinguish him from others. He's part of the same group. And that's actually, of course, a far more rational way to think about Africa than more, many more recent ones. But um, Shadel, unfortunately, didn't know that on empirical grounds. In theory, all men were capable of reason. All men were capable of conversion to the true religion. And these conclusions mattered in practice. Two Renaissance popes, Pius II and Pius III, passed ordinances outlawing slavery in Christian lands. Others, like Alexander VI and Innocent VIII, though they admitted that slavery was, uh, was a crime, allowed it because they said it would make it possible to convert those Africans who became slaves to Europeans, and many of them would be manumitted. In 1550 to 1551, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, faced with claims by colonists in the New World that the Indians whom they had subjected to their rule and bound to the land were naturally inferior, convoked an assembly of jurists and theologians to decide whether this question was true or false. It was an open question. It's one of the very few such debates, perhaps the only one one can think of, convoked by a conquering power in such circumstances with an absolute valence of power on the side of the conquerors. So in traditional intellectual history, we tended to think of this world as a world in which, at least in the realm of learning, in that realm of hard readers, racism was theoretically excluded. It was a story told by great historians like Guido Kish, a Jewish emigre, a great scholar, and somebody who simply could not find it believable that the beliefs that had destroyed his own career in life in the 20th century had antecedents in the period he studied. Um, I can only envy him his assurance. In the 1980s and 90s, too, a new kind of Renaissance scholarship attacked the notion that something like an idea of fixed race operated in this world from a different position. Great scholars like Natalie Davis and Stephen Greenblatt taught us to see the Renaissance world as one of self-fashioning, a world in which individuals didn't accept roles thrust upon them by the categories into which they were born, but created themselves, told their own stories, even when that meant telling their own stories to a judge when they were in prison, as Davis's women do in her wonderful book, Pardon Tales. These ways of thinking about identity in the Renaissance have inspired some extraordinary empirical work. Eric Dursteler, a historian of Venetians in the Eastern Mediterranean, takes this idea to the Italian community, the Venetian community in Constantinople, 
and finds it a world of Natalie Davis characters, people whose identity is labile from day to day or ship to ship. Christians in Italy who turn up as Jews in Istanbul and then convert to Islam and then turn up 20 years later back in Venice as Christians again. So there's a certain amount of evidence to suggest that certainly not everyone in this world saw racial or other group identities as fixed and absolute and inherited. I think the best way to think of this world is as of one that disposed of an enormous toolbox, but in which the tools were of very different kinds. There were ancient ideas that suggested that membership in one group or another might be a bad thing to claim. There were texts in the Bible, texts in the Fathers of the Church, texts in Greek and Latin that seemed, for example, to associate dark skin with a lower human worth. And there were texts that didn't. It was a complex toolbox. It could serve almost any purpose. So what we need to ask is, what purposes did it serve? Less, it's less helpful to look at the heritage than to see what happened to it. In fact, radically important things did happen to it in the 15th and 16th centuries. The first thing to realize is that that first genealogy was not the only one. The world was not only inhabited by the snug peoples who were born from Shem, Ham, and Japheth. You'll remember that when Othello appears, he, tells, he recalls telling his wife Desdemona of beings he'd encountered in his adventures. It was my hint to speak, he says, such was the process of the cannibals that each other eat, the anthropophagi, and men whose heads do grow beneath their shoulders. This to hear would Desdemona seriously incline. The peoples that Othello described also appear in the Nuremberg Chronicle. They're an extraordinary group, each of them representing not an individual prodigy, but a race, a so-called monstrous race. They came into existence in the fourth century BCE, to the best of our knowledge, when Greeks went to India. Greeks, like Americans, weren't good at languages. So when they reached India and saw Indian religious art, they either were too embarrassed in the age-old male way to ask a question, or else they didn't understand the, the answer. And they took Indian religious art as representing real peoples that inhabited the, the wondrous edges of the world. Hence the beginnings of this marvelous tribe some of whose attributes had practical functions, the skyopod or shadow foot man that you see um, near the bottom on the left obviously inhabits sunny places and uses his foot to shade himself from the world. <laughs> Others, um, like the man whose head appears below his shoulders um, or the, um, the ear flapper, um, simply represent either heightening or negation of, nor of what we're seeing as normal human traits. It's important to realize that these peoples, were, though monstrous physically, were not monstrous morally. The Greeks normally described them as better than Greeks or other inhabitants of the center of the world. More honest, less concerned with gain, hardworking and unselfish. And they remained popular figures through the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, traveling across cultural and linguistic borders and populating the Travels of Sir John de Mandeville, one of the great uh, bestsellers of the later Middle Ages, as well as the Nuremberg Chronicle. These figures literally didn't fit the mosaic genealogy. Here is the full page, the full two page opening from Shadel's Chronicle. You see the sons of Noah around the continents and another line of wild races on the side. They literally couldn't be fit into the normal genealogy. And their very existence, to some extent, performed a liberatory function so far as the ancient genealogies were concerned, opening up, as Florica Egmund and Peter Mason have shown, a kind of imaginative space where those who contemplated them could think of other non-biblical genealogies for parts of the human race. Yet these images also shaped and confined the ethnographic imagination. These images of peoples to be found outside the known world interfered between Western observers and the non-Western peoples they actually encountered. From the 15th century on, Western explorers encountered Africans who had used lip plates to expand especially their lower but also their upper lips. 
But for centuries, as Jean-Michel Massang, a great historian of African art, has taught us, they found it impossible to portray or describe these people in a precise way. For back in the seventh century, the Spanish encyclopedist Isidore of Seville had called up a new, a new monstrous race, a race of those whose one lower lip was so enormous that they could cover their faces with it as they slept. And that these were innocent, said Isidore, who didn't use money or value precious stones. That image lasts and lasts and comes back. It appears in places Europeans hadn't been, like the uh, center of this map of Africa. You can see two of these people sitting together um, just over there by Ghana. It appears on the edge, they appear on the edge of the world as here on the left, beyond anywhere where they can be located. And they really almost replace the real people in travel accounts and cosmographies. It would be nice to be able to say that empirically accurate depictions drove these off the market in the course of the 16th century. In fact, they didn't. The strange, the monstrous, the unempirical are, if anything, more popular at the end of the 16th century than they were at the beginning. So, free-floating images. This is one of the ways in which this ancient heritage could work. It could open your mind and eye. It could close your mind and eye. Many, perhaps most, of the ideas that Europeans brought to bear on these questions were extremely labile. Knives that could cut in two different ways. You could, for example, believe, this was an idea that went back to the ancient Hippocratic doctors, that climate shaped individuals, or diet, or exercise, or all of these things together. That could mean that each people had a particular fixed character. But as peoples moved, the characters could change. Jean Baudin, who re, re, sorry, who re, uh, reconfigured this theory in the 16th century in a great manual on how to think about history and the past, used it brilliantly on the Walloons, the f inhabitants of Flanders. Look, he said, at their Latin name. It's really, it's like Mark Bloch. He's using the linguistic tool to work out their early history. The Walloons were called Uwalones in Latin. Obviously, they were French speakers who had wandered the primeval forest saying, Uwalonu, Uwalonu, and could be traced back to an original habit, habitat in France. Of course, as you traced them back to their original habitat, were you explaining a fixed character that they had somehow arrived at at the end of the journey, or a changing, mutable character? Blood was often thought of as giving a, a real shape to individuals as transmitted to them, either through the semen of the male who impregnated a woman, or the milk of a nursing mother. But once again, you could imagine the transfer of blood as being a stabilizing factor that unified groups or one that transformed them and turned them into hybrids. Almost any combination was possible. What matters is first that the set of ideas was so rich and secondly that circumstances changed. For the 15th and 16th centuries were of course a tremendous age of globalization and people in motion. The establishment of European hegemony in the New World, European trading systems into Asia, the European extension of the African slave trade to oceanic lengths, and the pushing within Europe of Jews into motion of many kinds. As this new set of contacts catalyzed the floating and contradictory and rich set of old ideas, I would argue, and I think there's a lot of recent scholarship to support this, ideas that groups really had fixed traits begin to crystallize. One sees this most clearly and distinctly in the case of black Africans. And it's obvious why, from being people who had appeared in Europe only rarely, they suddenly were part of a slave trade. And a slave trade that really mattered, since the fall of Constantinople had cut off Europe's existing supply of Slavic and Circassian slaves and made it absolutely necessary to bring slaves from Africa by no means all of them black Africans, to replace them doing domestic and other kinds of labor. And it is, oh sorry, I, I forgot, but here are two of these people with the, the wonderful large lips, and they exemplify the simplicity and virtue 
that go with this particular stereotype. The one of them is trading a gold nugget to the other for a little houseplant because he doesn't value the precious metal in the greedy way a European would. Now, well, Africans had come to Europe. Princes and ambassadors had come and, sometime, and been treated as princes and ambassadors. The Roman church of Santo Stefano of the Abyssinians had had its black monks from Ethiopia since the 11th century. The doorway there is the original doorway, though the rest of the facade was added and redone in the 18th century. But in the 15th century, as the slave trade expanded, the situation changed radically. First of all in Portugal, then more and more in the rest of Europe. Nicolaus Klenertz, a humanist, a teacher like Kasaubin, though actually not like him very much as a person, went to Evora in the late 15th century. He said, I'd hardly set foot in this Portuguese city, and I felt as if I had been transported to a city in hell because I came across black people everywhere. Perhaps it's not hard to read a certain prejudice in that statement. What Klenert saw as archival evidence that Kate Lowe and others have put together and analyzed in a new way was a society in which perhaps 10% of the population in Evora and other Portuguese cities was black. Some of, it, uh, some of it free, some of it enslaved, where, as he observed, families tended to have black female house slaves, and where, as he didn't realize, free blacks also carried out a large number of callings. The material about blacks in Europe is very rich, though historians like me barely noticed it until the last 20 years or so, and it's now really beginning to be collected in a serious way. And what it shows us is how rapidly a stereotype can, or set of stereotypes can form. John Hope Franklin, who went to his death regretting that stereotypes hadn't changed as much as he had hoped they might in the course of his long lifetime, would, I think, have been grimly satisfied to hear the story that the archives tell us. In the archive, we see black Africans working at many different kinds of tasks, baking bread, running fencing schools, um, working as laborers, working as household slaves, uh, working as divers, working as swimming instructors, um, carrying out a fast range of tasks. But we see them in more and more images, as in the Adoration of the Magi, where from the late Middle Ages on, one of the three Magi is normally portrayed as black. But artistic portrayals don't take us nearly as far as the archives do. The artistic portrayals, in fact, embody what seems to be a stereotype taking shape. They show us blacks carrying out only a very limited number of the things they did. Working as musicians, drumming here in Nuremberg, playing the trumpet here in London, dancing here in Lisbon, and working as the loyal servant who will help Judith even when she has a, the head of Holofernes to get rid of. The images, in other words, confined black Africans to a very familiar range of callings. And what that suggests, and this is something that David Goldenberg has argued in his magnificent book on the curse of Ham, Benjamin Browdy and others, is that the experience of joining in the slave trade and making that a world trade catalyzed Europe's ideas about black people. What had been hints and suggestions came together, and black people came to be seen as unified by certain shared characteristics, which were not taken, which were not seen in a complementary way. The archival documents also reveal many prejudices at work. Slave traders, for example, found the designs scored on the faces of African men and women a problem, harder to sell them than to hard to sell those who didn't. They found light skin more valuable than dark. We can actually see the prices. Most remarkably of all, they already speak of black Africans in terms that any American can sadly recognize in almost the same moment, praising them for their powers of work, their extraordinary energy, 
and denouncing them for as a Florentine inventory of household possessions, which includes a female slave did in 1480. Well, she works badly and is of little worth. Like all black females, she is lazy. So not just a set of stereotypes, but of contradictory stereotypes. At that point, it doesn't seem to me unfair to think that one's talking about something like an idea of race, shared, heritable, identifiable, visible, and probably ineradicable. One of my learned men provides a salient example of these views, Klenertz, whose verdict on Aver I've already quoted. He was a great schoolmaster, the author of brilliant textbooks on how to read and write classical Greek, and a great charismatic teacher. In the new humanistic system of schools, Renaissance scholars revived study of the Greek and Latin classics and convinced members of the social elite that this was the best possible formation for young men and a few young women who would occupy important positions, that they could simultaneously master the best of Greek and Latin thought and the decorum and deportment that befitted gentlemen and ladies, as you see them doing in this classroom with silence written on the back, more or less the Renaissance version of shut your laptops. Um, Clenardus, while in Portugal, bought three slaves. And he taught them Latin orally. But he didn't do this as a testimony of his sense of humanity. He named them Carbo, Dento, and Negrinus, coal, toothy, and blacky. And he used them for demonstrations in which he would give them orders in Latin. And they would jump up and down, crawl on the ground like animals, make faces, and show that they understood his Latin. His own words give a vivid sense of how he saw them. Others who wear purple take great delight in monkeys. I, when tired of study, enjoy my monkeys who have the power of reason. The signifying monkey, but even the signifying dictated in this case by the master. One hopes that isn't true, but of course we have only his testimony. Uh, it's, it's a grim world to look at when you open your eyes to these questions and it's a world in which something like a vision of race is clear. Something like a vision of race is also clear in much of the Jewish world in the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries, as David Nirenberg, Maria Elena Martinez, and other historians have taught us. In Iberia, on the one hand, after the great massacres of 1391, many Jews were killed, but many more converted to Christianity, as did many Muslims. And through the 15th and 16th centuries, contact brought more and more problems, more and more trouble, as old Christians, Christians of long Christian ancestry, came to believe that Christian, the Jewish converts and Muslim converts, whose Christianity they didn't believe in, were displacing them in important offices. Jews, by contrast, became angrier and angrier at the attacks that they had suffered in 1391 and after, at a rhetoric that was more and more demeaning about Jewishness. So genealogy became more and more an obsession, but not universal genealogy, particular genealogy. Sephardic Jews began to write their own history as a separate race who went back to the noble Jews of the Old Testament and had never been alloyed by lesser strains. Christians began to develop tools to exclude those of Jewish descent or Muslim descent from office. By the middle of the 16th century, genealogy had become a powerful tool of exclusion. Officials had grown up, a whole cluster of officials whose job it was to facilitate your effort if you wanted to be, say, a familiar for the Inquisition by helping you to prove that your ancestry was all Christian something that might involve inquiries in villages in Asturia, Havana, Lima, wherever members of your family or people who knew them had been. So a vast, typically Iberian world of papers, bureaucracy, um, professional expertise grew up. All of it dedicated to the proposition that, one might say to coin a phrase, race mattered, that proving your membership in a group was vital to proving your qualifications for preferment. In 1492, as everybody knows, the Jews of Iberia were expelled. 
And as they were expelled, as Jews went into motion through the rest of Europe, they found a situation in which, once again, a new vision of Jews and Jewishness, like that new vision of blacks and blackness, was being elaborated. There is an ancient history of Jewish stereotypes. This is a famous 13th century caricature of a Jew from England. And it's easy to see a facial characteristic that remains part of the Jewish caricature to this day. But once again, as with blacks, it's the 15th and 16th centuries that seem to be the crucial moment, the moment when actual contact catalyzes traditional ideas. In the 15th century, Bernardino of Siena and other preachers were already and influentially demanding that Jews who had lived in Italian cities since the Roman Empire move into limited areas, wear yellow patches to identify them, or if they were women, wear earrings to distinguish them from respectable Christian women. In 1474 in Trent began the first of a series of famous blood libel trials. A group of Jews were accused of having captured and murdered a Christian boy, Simon of Trent, to use his blood. Um, it's a little bit mysterious. Later it turns out that it's for making matzah. Um, the, standard, the standard trial method of Roman, of Roman jurisprudence, oh, sorry, the strapado, proved capable of extracting confessions from the majority of the Jews who were accused. And the printing press, which could put such events in crystalline form in thousands of copies, spread the idea that Jews had committed such a crime to other cities, first in Germany and then elsewhere in Europe. So many communities, not just Iberian ones, expelled their Jews. It's a great time of Jewish movement towards Eastern Europe, where tolerance was greater. There's a certain symmetry that becomes apparent to intellectuals as these two processes go on. And by the end of the 16th century, it's possible to find more than one intellectual, more than one qualified observer who brings blacks and Jews together as exemplifying the permanently, ineradicably evil traits that could set a group off from the rest of humanity. Prudencio de Sandoval, bishop and biographer of Charles II, asked, who would deny that in the descendants of Jews there remains and lasts the bad inclination of their ancient ingratitude and failed beliefs, as in blacks there remains and lasts the inseparable accident of their negritude? One set of characteristics passed on by teaching and socialization, one presumably by blood and semen and milk, both equally ineradicable and the Jewish one, if anything, the more serious because in the soul rather than in the accidents of the body. Now, in the Oxford that Kasaubin knew, oh, sorry, uh, once again, I forgot two of my pictures. As Christians worry about the Jews in their midst, a new genre grows up of texts which Rani Shah, a great historian of this period, has called ethnographies of the Jews, treatises on Jewish life and ritual written first by converts and then later on by Christian experts. Extraordinarily detailed, they often tell us things we otherwise wouldn't know about the synagogue and communal life of the time, but always negative in their observation and always emphatically concentrated on Jewish habits that reflected a kind of trust in magical ritual rather than true repentance, as here the Tashli ritual of Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year, where you throw your sins to the bread, to the fish in the river, or here from Yom Kippur, the Kaparos ritual, which involves whirling a chicken around one's head, um, again, as a purificatory ritual. Jews were seen often as, not just as an evil, but as a magical people, a people who had special powers to wreak harm. That's part of this complex that grows up. Now, back to the grumpy humanists in Oxford these grumpy men. Let's go back to them and look with a little bit of precision at how they responded to Jacob Barnett's flight. And if we do so, in the light of the toolbox I've tried to lay out in these catalytic moments, I think it becomes clear that Barnett, and I'm happy to say Kasaubin, had to contend with prejudice that wasn't merely religious. It was also in a profound way racial. Jacob ran away. The first person faced with a problem was William Twiss. He had written a careful sermon to celebrate the Jews' conversion.
but he was a deaf man. He sat down and wrote another sermon denouncing the Jew and showing and saying that he showed God's judgment on that whole perverse nation and people. So the immediate reaction was to take Jacob's refusal as emblematic of a wider one. Mark Kilby, the Hebrew professor who admired Barnett's learning and who was his patron, wrote to Kasaubin when the Jew was in prison that he promises many things, but whether he does this from the soul or by pretense, only God can know, for only God knows men's hearts. I don't think it's safe to convert him anymore, said Kilby, lest he return again like the dog to his vomit. Here, of course, he quotes a famous passage from Proverbs, quoted in the New Testament and to Peter, and often applied to Jews and others whose conversions failed, but which also alludes to the ancient connection between Jews and animals, the pigs who were said to suckle them, or the dogs with whom they were often connected. The most sharp and revealing reaction, though, is that of Arthur Lake. He was the warden of New College. He was the one who set horsemen and footmen after Jacob Barnett to haul him back to Oxford. And he preached a whole series of sermons at St. Mary's Church in which the incident came up for discussion. Barnett Lake made clear that he did not see Jews as visibly bearing the stigmata of their evil. Every nation, he said, may have Pharisees and Sadducees. But he used his knowledge of Hebrew, and he was a good Hebraist who actually endowed a Hebrew lectureship in Oxford, to argue that the Jews were actually worse than Turks, because the Turks were only not Christians, but as Muslims they revered Jesus. The Jews, by contrast, thanked God in their prayers that they hadn't been made Gentiles or Christians. They actually prayed against the true God. Most remarkable of all is his conclusion. This sin is not personal to some few of them, but national. The same malice is found in them all. Neither is it only national, but natural also. They have for so many generations brought up their children in it that we may well say that sin is grown to them to the highest. Among them there is neither good egg nor good bird. They fill up the measure of their father's iniquity. Nay, they far exceed them. So for Lake, as for most of the critics of the Jews, what made the Jews what they were was conditioning, training, education, ritual, marriage within the community. But the consequences were racial. The Jews were a group who simply could not do better. Obviously, not everyone saw Jews this way. Those of you who've read Michel de Montaigne's wonderful travel diary will remember how on the 30th of January, 1581, he goes to the synagogue in Rome to see the oldest religious ceremony that still goes on, as he says, a circumcision. He listens to the Jews praying, watches them babbling to each other about this and that, says they don't seem very interested in their prayers. They're somewhat like us. And then when the baby is circumcised, he says, the baby cries as our babies cry when they're baptized. And clearly, it was possible to see Jews in a very different way. Peter Goldman did. When Goldman was studying Hebrew with Jacob Barnett, he wrote to a friend of the Jews' paternal relation to him. When I stumble, he holds me up. When I run into the wall, he pulls me back. No wonder that he wrote to Kasaubin, a more famous and powerful scholar, begging him to help. And the most rich and for me, the most rewarding case, because I like to see a poor little bent over scholar be a brave and a man of integrity, is Kasaubin. Kasaubin refused to accept the normal reading of what Jacob had done. He said that Jacob had been wrong to pretend that he wanted to convert. But he also insisted that Jacob was not an example of anything but himself. In his letters to his friends in Oxford, he never treats Jacob as a member of a group. He simply says, he's such a deep Jewish scholar. He's caught in those labyrinths of the Talmud. His identity intellectually is so Jewish. He can't convert. He's deeply, deeply Jewish. He speaks of Jacob's love for his family and the way he talked about them. For Kasaubin, unlike his friends in Oxford, Jacob's refusal to convert reflected a personal decision and a set of personal qualities, not altogether admirable, but altogether human and altogether excusable. Kasaubin 
didn't just see the episode differently than the gentleman in Oxford. He went to the king through a high prelate in a wonderful letter in which he says, he's a learned man. I owe him a great debt. We must honor that. He doesn't want to convert. And I can't see that as a crime. And the king, I'm happy to say, listened. The privy council dispatched a king's man with a writ to Oxford, telling the dons to release the Jew from prison. The king's man took him to Dover and put him on a boat. And he next turns up a year later as the French monarchy's expert consultant on Jewish affairs at the Louvre in Paris. <laughs> a man of parts and a happy ending to the story. What's been most fascinating to me, both about working through and working up this story, which is densely archival and has required a great deal of ransacking of illegible documents, and about thinking about this story for this occasion, has been seeing it from this perspective, a perspective that wouldn't have been the first one I brought to it. I had thought of this, above all, as a religious question, a question of a failed conversion, and I had read the documents that way. And it was Val Smith's opportune request to say something about race that first made me say, race, what do I know about race? Then made me read some of the wonderful new scholarship which I've presented to you here. And finally, made me bring that scholarship back to the territory that I cultivate and I hope bring up some flowers that I wouldn't have brought up before, as well as some noxious weeds. Most fascinating, hardest for us to understand, always as historians, as perhaps in everyday life, how it is that complexes like this infect some and not others. How someone like Kasaubin, who knew only a few real Jews, could know them as people, when other Christians who also knew only a few real Jews and were also steeped in Jewish writing couldn't do so. That's a mystery which, as a historian, I probably can't solve. But one thing I can say about this little story is that it has a big moral. Renaissance scholars, scholars who work on Europe, need to think about race every bit as much as those who work on these United States in its past and in its present. I'm deeply grateful to have had my nose pressed against the extraordinary scholarship that's revealed to us the history of race in the centuries I work on. And I'm even more grateful to have found my own scholarly toolbox enhanced and enriched by doing so. I thank you all. Thank you very much for a brilliant lecture, not just by your eloquence, but your refreshing insights. Uh, um, I like the idea of toolbox, the, I guess, Fevre's outillage mental. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering about, um, I mean, you, you, you mentioned Montaigne and this wonderful passage uh, in Rome when he's visiting the synagogues. Uh, very surprising and maybe shocking to some because, um, after all, uh, in the capital of Christianity, <laughs> Catholic Church, uh, he chooses to visit the synagogues. Um, and, uh, but I was wondering if um, there he's really interested in the Jews, just as is he really interested in the cannibals when then in a cha famous chapter of his essays he uh, spends time describing the, the customs of the, of the cannibals. I mean, doesn't he have always his European readership in mind? And um, isn't he using the Jews or the 
uh, American Indians as a prop or as a uh, almost, I mean, it isn't alterity or otherness for him uh, more a strategy than anything else? Uh, I mean, or are you, or do you think there's already a sort of anthropological pursuit there that would bring him closer to us? Um, I should say that this is Professor Riccolo, the editor of Montaigne's travel diary. <laughs> so so I, 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 I tremble as I reply. Uh, but I actually do think there's more to it than that. There's no question that Montaigne uses everything for many purposes, as he uses the ancients, as he uses the story of the Spartan boy who lets the fox gnaw his entrails. But what fascinates me is his ability to use circumcision as something to think about the other as human. As the scene of circumcision fascinates Christians in this period. Every description of Jewish life, however brief, has a description of the circumcision ceremony in it. And the ones I've read, and I've read many, are never accompanied by the observations of similarity that Montaigne makes. That's what I find so fascinating. It's a, it's a kind of topos when you talk about the Jews, you talk about, how, you talk about how the baby is prepared and how the moil does his work and the fingernails and so on. But you don't say, oh yeah, it's just like a baptism. So for me, um, it's certainly true that Montaigne finds Jews good to think with, as he finds everything good to think with. But I'd say that his way of thinking, like Kasaubin's way of thinking, is distinctive. He's certainly writing within a Western, con Western Christian context for other Christians. But I see a willingness to think across, which I don't see in everyone. And that's why I link um, Montaigne and Kasaubin. It seems to me that they, they share this quality. In, in, um, in the, relig the religious representations of people who are of black origin and hence features or of Jewish origin, you do seem to get a shift in the 15th century because in Iberia most particularly, the concern is how to maintain domination over people once they have become Christians since theoretically you're not supposed to enslave Christians. Now, as Jews convert to Christianity, and so many old Christians want to maintain domination over them and exclude them from the higher ranks of society, you have to bring in the notion of race. With blacks, it seems to be the same thing. The odd black in the 13th, 14th century poses no threat and doesn't really raise a tremendous problem. But in the 15th century, with the beginning of the mass slave trade, how do you justify keeping people in slavery if you are also justifying your enslavement of them by Christianizing them. How can you reconcile the Christianity and the slavery? Well, you can't. It's actually one of the, the worst world, I mean, for Christian hypocrisy, um, it's hard to beat Christian attitudes towards slavery. I mean, take Pius III, not my favorite pope anyhow. 1537, he, he, he condemned slavery in a magnificent bull, sublimus Deus. 1548, by then, his cardinals have been complaining because some of them have 50 or 60 or 80 slaves on their villas. And so he issues what we now call a signing statement, but what you called in those days a motu proprio, saying, well, it's okay to have slaves in Rome. <laughs> and no, this is, there, this is really a, a terrible chapter in the history of, the, of uh, theology and its application to human problems. And the Protestants don't come out any better, of course, once they have a chance to involve themselves. Um, on the question of Jewish features, that's a really complicated one. And I, I didn't want, it, it's sort of, you know, that's one of those scholarly Vietnams. You get in and you can't get out. And I, I, I didn't want to start it up. I think you can, you can argue already in the 15th century, even in the Simon of Trent image, that there are characteristic Jewish features among the uh, perpetrators. But the theological argument is always that what, what's wrong with Jews is inside, not outside. Uh, the, 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 the deep evil of Jews is something you can't see, it's some, and that's what makes them dangerous. So, and that is what I think my, the people I've been working on felt. Of course, they, their Jews are mostly imaginary um, anyhow, but I think that, they would have said that, that they couldn't tell a Jew by the look. Um, 
No, this is just such a wonderful moment to have you part of the Baldwin, Baldwin Lectures. I mean, for me, it's a, uh, have a great humanist scholar of early modernity reflecting on the great issue of late modernity, Anthony Grafton on race. So that just gets me excited, just the idea of it. And to have you give the lecture that you did uh, makes me even more intensely excited. I've got two questions, though, brother. First, that when you talk about the, the internality of Jews as a justification, as opposed to the externality in relation to Africans, does it have something to do with the fact that Jews always already are part of European identity because of the legacies of Jerusalem juxtaposed to the legacies of Athens? So there's no way out. They're not trying to gain a foothold. Their tradition is one of the pillars and foundations. So that in part, you, you can't attack, attack a long tradition of intellectuality, intelligence, what the Greeks would call noose and so forth. It's just the inability of them to agree with us. Now that strikes me as having, could be just as vicious in terms of the treatment, but it has a very different kind of status than Africans who have no foothold, no tradition as part and parcel of the makings of early European identity, and therefore the attacks on their intelligence is first and foremost. I mean, to, adapt, to attack the tradition of Jewish intelligence on behalf of Christians, you know, it's like Bruce Springsteen attacking Money Waters, right? That, that, that's your foundation, you know what I mean? You can't attack Jewish intelligence when the very basis of who you are comes out of their traditions. They would be true in terms of moral conscience and so forth. Africans, much more open to vicious dehumanization across the board, body, and so forth and so on. That would be my first question. The second question is back to this mystery, though. That this, 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 this sense of why certain individuals muster the courage to pursue integrity, honesty, moral consistency. How would you account for that in your own life? What is it about you <laughs> that, that, that pushes you in that direction? I mean, there's many contemporaries in your own guild who would be very much like some of the people you describe. You identify with this chap. You identify with the guy who is getting in the most trouble, taking the most risk. I don't say this for, just for you to promote yourself, but just to be honest because we need lessons in this regard in this present moment in relation to these kinds of issues. So two different kind of questions, I'm sorry to go on, but just an expression of my excitement. Uh, well, the first one's a lot easier. Um, <laughs> what, what really strikes you, the more you read the, um, the literature of so-called ethnography and the literature of Christians about Jews in the 16th century, is how easy they find it to deny Jewish intelligence. Uh, and there are a number of tactics that you can employ. One is to say, well, Maimonides is a smart Jew, so we'll consider him a kind of honorary Arab. We know they're smart, uh, and he wrote in Arabic anyhow. Or an honorary scholastic, since he's in Latin and he's been in the curriculum you know, since forever. So Maimonides gets a pass, because nobody could possibly pretend that Maimonides was, was anything but brilliant. But you kind, of, you kind of take him out of the game. Ancient Jewry, fine, no problem. They did their historic job. So the patriarchs are fine, the prophets are fine. No problem with them. The two great Jews who wrote in Greek, Philo and Josephus, you basically say, well, they're practically Christian anyhow. Uh, and, you know, and, and, you know, and besides, they were very early on. You know, it's hard, you, know, you really can't expect conversion in somebody who lives through the fall of the temple in Jerusalem like Josephus. So they kind of get a pass. But when it comes to rabbinical scholarship, when it comes to the kinds of things the Jews are interested in, I've been astonished at how angry, how vituperative, how negative the most learned Christians are. I spent a couple of months in Switzerland working on Johannes Buxdorf, who's a very, very great Hebraist. He uh, lived in Basel. He taught in Basel. Uh, he edited the Hebrew Bible, many other texts in Hebrew. Uh, and uh, he wrote the Judenschule, 1603, which is the first really comprehensive ethnography of the, in this case, Ashkenazic Jewish world. It tells you a whole Jew's life cycle from birth and circumcision to death 
the entire year of festivals, the way in which the synagogue worked. He'd been in synagogues, he'd listened to services. Um, much that he tells us is not known from Jewish sources at the time and is only known from him. And the best Jewish scholars, friends of mine like Eliot Horowitz, would say he's a very reliable source. We can really believe him. He can't stand Jews for most of his life. He's fascinated. He wants everyone, every scholar to write good Hebrew. He actually writes the manual of how to write letters in Hebrew. You know, you gotta, if you're going to be a Latinist, you've got to write Latin. If you're going to be a Hebraist, you've got to write Hebrew. Uh, but he has nothing good to say about Jews. He goes to a, a, a circumcision, which he describes, and the sermon is about how you know, the, the law is a tree of life to those who hold fast to it. And he says, oh, most wooden sermon I ever heard. Yuck, yuck, yuck. And he, you know, every comment about a Jewish interpretation or a Jew is, is negative. And yet I've looked at his notebooks and he talked to Jews. He did ethnography talking to individual Jews. At one point he's having a conversation with a guy whose name is Jacob Seforim Traeger, Jacob the book schlepper. So sort of a Jewish book peddler who produces little devotional books for women in Yiddish. And, and, you know, I mean, and, and you know, he talks to this guy, borrows books from him, he gets Jewish lore from him, but he can't stand them. It's one of the most extraordinary attraction of opposites. I think in, in French ethnography of the 19th and 20th century, one can find parallels to this. Uh, and of course there's, uh, you know, and, and indeed, uh, you know, probably in other ethnographic traditions as well. But I've been stunned by this. I didn't expect it. And it really, this attitude really forced itself on me as I read the, as I read the, the sources. Um, you, know, you assume that if somebody dedicates his life to a people and to literature and knows them so deeply as that, that he would have some affection for them. And there's little bits of evidence that late in life his attitude changed, but very late in life. As to the second, um, I'm, I'm just a history professor in New Jersey. <laughs> um, there's a, one of the terrible temptations that afflicts um, academics um, is to think of themselves as public intellectuals. There are academics who are public intellectuals. Hi, Cornell. And we, <laughs> and we really need them, and they do an incredibly valuable thing. I'm a history professor who occasionally writes a book review um, you know, for a public larger than the one in, in small double figures that reads my books. So, um, I, I don't have any exalted ideas about what I do. The only thing that I try to do is go where the sources take me, and they've taken me lots of places I didn't ever expect to be, and to learn from my colleagues. Uh, you know, as long as you kind of keep your mind open that way, you, you can always get um, less bad at what you do. That's my example. Froma? I'm sorry. So François Ricolo uh, can, can help me as well. And I've had occasion uh, to work on the ancient novel of Heliodorus. And it, uh, in the beginning, in, in uh, French humanism, the famous Jacques Amiot, who was the great translator of the, of the Greek romances, uh, tra the first thing that he translated was the great Heliodorus, the, the story of Theagenes and Caraclea. Uh, the punchline of this, of this, um, uh, of this remarkably crazy novel um, is that a, is the, is takes place in Ethiopia, that's why it's, it's actually the, also called the Ethiopian tale, and in which, um, uh, in which this, this weird thing of a white daughter who was born to black parents, uh, and the mother would fe fear that she would be accused of adultery, and she exposed the child. And eventually, how they all get back there. Now, this Ethiopia is a rather remarkable place, and the king is an extraordinary king. They have a little problem there about human sacrifice, but that gets solved eventually. Uh, that's only only after victory over the uh, in a victory thing, but 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 certainly within the whole range of ancient ideas about the ideal kingship, uh, this king has every one of those characteristics. He's magnanimous. He's generous. He's uh, he's he's com and compassionate. Uh, he's moderate. Uh, he's law-abiding and, and and just. So I'm wondering whether, uh, I don't know that that was Amyo's first choice as to why he chose that, which also had a great, huge influence on the later development of, um, uh, of, of the novel, actually, in Europe. So in terms of whether there was any fallout from the actual plot of the story and whether 
either you or Francois or someone else who works in the Renaissance uh, could tell me how the reaction was to this. They loved the book. Um, but there's never any problem with Ethiopia. Um, I mean, there are, of course, problems with Ethiopia. But Ethiopia is a known kingdom. It has a learned tradition. It has its own church, its own literature. Um, it has its representation in Rome for centuries and centuries. So there's no, it's not hard. And indeed, going back to antiquity, there are descriptions of Ethiopians as lordly and beautiful. And so it's, it's never hard for a humanist, I think, to imagine Ethiopia in very favorable terms. So I, I think that you know, there's, there's a reason why that text is, is easily acceptable. It's easily acceptable. Yeah. It's just Ethiopia is a, is a very special case. There's a question right here. Oh, OK. I'm the last one. Well, I'm glad to be able to thank you. Um, that was um, just tremendously enlightening and exciting to hear um, the ways in which your work has been enlivened by this conversation. And I'm coming from performance studies and African American studies and literature. And I'm really interested in questions of archival opacities. Um, so, and forgive me if being outside of your field, someone has already written this book. But um, how do you write? How do you write a history of um, the um, swim instructor of African descent? Um, you know, how do you what? How do you put that piece that together? Um, especially if the documents aren't there to do this kind of tra traditional historiographical kinds of studies. And I know from performance studies, I often kind of work with these sorts of ways through Stephen Greenblatt's work, um, through my colleagues like um, Kim Hall and Arthur Little working in literature with trying to imagine what those, who those figures are and what they're like. For instance, I can't remember the brother's name who came f to Holland. Oh, um, Capitan. Right, Dr. yeah, Capitan. okay, right? Yeah, I don't know, mm. yeah. But, you know, just how you, I would love for our grad students to be able to hear how you go about doing that kind of work. Well, the, the I mean, there are many ways of trying to do this. One of the really um, brave ones, and I think in many ways very successful, is that of my great colleague Natalie Zeman Davis, who in a recent book called Trickster Travels, tells the life story of an African who comes to Europe, lives there for some time, ends up going back, and writes the book from which Europeans get much of their ethnographic knowledge of the northern parts of Africa in the 16th century, Leo Affair. And the record is tremendously scattered and difficult. And she uses her enormous knowledge of the rest of the archive to fill in and build his story where she can't document him. She documents people in his circle, people like him, comparable experiences. Now, obviously, it's, you have to be as brave as Natalie is to do that because it's always, you know, the, the pro one of the problems with history is it's very perverse and you actually get to the archive and people don't act the way you would want them or expect them to do. And so if you're going to fill in, you have to assume that most people will act in recent sort of predictable ways by the norms that you recreate. So it's a high risk method, but it's had extraordinary results for her, especially in that book. It wasn't the, fir the first book that she, she used it was, of course, The Return of Martingale, which is another extraordinary success. Um, the second thing which we now do is that we're much more omnivores about the archive than we used to be. And I think we're, we're just better able, thanks to never having given up the old questions and getting generations of new ones, to see that things in the archive um, might get us places, um, like that conversation that my colleague and I were able to restore. This is the first time in history that we can actually show a Jew teaching a Christian how to read the Jewish law. It happened before this, but this is, we've actually, we can show the conversation. We can show you which part of the book he points to, how then he pulls the other book off the shelf. Then he explains that this commentator is the grandson of Rashi, the great commentator. We, you know, that, that kind of thing is, and that is what the swim instructor needs and the fencing teacher and the others to the extent that it's possible. The problem with social history is that what you get is vast numbers of passing references, and it's very hard in a period to pull them together and make a three, bring, a, bring a three-dimensional world back to life. But that is what needs to be done. Um, it, you know, this is a good thing. We have a lot of historians and a lot of time. 
And, uh, you know, and, and it really is an, it's an enormous challenge. I would say 20 years ago, it would, or 30 years ago, nobody would have imagined writing a book on blacks, black Africans in Renaissance Europe, you know, of a sort which is now being read. And as people write these things, they see more in the archive than they saw. Um, Jews also are vastly more prominent in our current vision of early modern Europe than they were before, both imaginary, imaginary Africans, imaginary Jews, and real ones. And you know, I think that this is over time. You simply, you, with luck, you see more, and the students see more than we do. And eventually, we will have three-dimensional stories. It's, you know, it's very hard, even for Capitan, who's an absolutely fascinating character. Um, we don't, he went back to Guinea to be a, a missionary, and we don't really know what happened there. Uh, which is you know, terribly frustrating because it would be fascinating to see how he brought this um, European culture and this um, uh, Dutch, Dutch Calvinism into the world in which he was born and what he did to be an intermediary. That's, that's where you want to hear, and that's where the documents fade. But you know, discoveries get made. There's always hope. marvelous place to, um, to conclude at least temporarily this conversation. Uh, Tony, on behalf of the Center for African American Studies, again, I just want to thank you so much for accepting our invitation and for sharing this remarkable, rich, elegant, eloquent uh, uh, lecture with us this afternoon and for continuing in the tradition of the James Baldwin Lectures. Please join me once again in thanking Tony Brown. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really, I've got a huge amount of this, and I can't thank you enough.